Welcome to Metabolic Matters Podcast, where we embark on conversations with thought leaders, disruptors, change agents, and passionate souls. Together, we'll delve into what truly matters to them. And you'll learn how to metabolize this newfound wisdom so you can transform your own metabolic health. Now let's meet today's guest. Hello, Jason, it is such an absolute joy to have you here. Um, I was talking a little bit behind the scenes before we started, before you even joined uh, into the room. I was talking to Lynn, our behind the scenes person here of, of I've really only known you since October. I mean, mm-hmm. I've known of you for a while, which is why most people who are listening might've heard of you as well. And I'm excited if they haven't, they're gonna just be blown away. But to get to know you and to be with you very briefly in an event that we were at together in October and again a short time later in a massive event in uh, December, which you and I luckily got sat next to each other at a dinner one night. And I felt like I just felt like a kindred spirit Mm. in such a moment. And so it's so beautiful to have connection and sort of mutual recognition, sort of like this so good to see you again, my friend type of vibe. It's really lovely. And so I was drawn to you more initially for just who you are as a person. And the conversations we've had since have blown my mind as to what you know and what you're bringing to this planet. But I just want to start this conversation for a little transparency. And I might've mentioned this before, but I think it's important for our listeners to hear this. I honestly gave very little, very little attention to mold throughout my practice in the past. Just, I I thought living in the desert Southwest, going to medical school in Arizona, living in Durango, Colorado, I was like, I don't have to worry about this. I live in the desert. There's no mold. I was like, I mean, just me, like you're laughing already. He's like, oh, you dummy. But that's the place that I lived in until unfortunately mold grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me awake to realize that these symptoms that I had thought were the, my old autoimmune patterns wreaking havoc or my cancer pattern in the past wreaking havoc was to realize that in my detective work, mycotoxins and mold were driving this crazy train. And it humbled me to the core in my own, it, it, it brought me to my knees, my friend. It was one of the most difficult, challenging health crises I've ever experienced. And that's a lot coming from someone who nearly died multiple times from a cancer diagnosis so so humbling and i am incredibly grateful to have you here because i feel like i still don't know anything about this and it's just a joy to have someone who's expert in the field here and that we get to do this together we get to we get to help bust other people's ideas around this as well so jason welcome thank you for being here it's so so good to be here and uh, all, all of those feelings are are mutual um you know uh, kindred spirit indeed uh, I felt like uh, you're, you, you are, by the way, uh, and I think I can speak for anyone who I know who has been in your presence. You're the kind of person that if you're within three feet of you, it feels like you're giving them a hug. Um, and so that's a, it's, you've got a very, very special way about you. And so, so I was honored to meet you in the first place, but then to have Kismet bring us and sit us next to each other. Um, it was beautiful, you know, I, so I, and the conversation unfolded in, in a way that I, um, in retrospect, I'm not surprised, uh, mm-hmm. but, but it brought me to, uh, to some fascinating places, brought me to actually some of my, some other new awarenesses of my own. And I've learned quite a bit from you too. And, and, wow. um, and so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, honored. Thank you, my friend. So who, how did you become the famed mold guy, guru, <laughs> guru of the mold, keeper of the mold, whisper, mold whisper, got mold is your website, which I think is so freaking, freaking stellar that you, you know, uh, created a little levity in bringing a very you know, dense, you know, conversation to the masses. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, you know, people introduce me as a mold expert all the time. And one thing I can say is that, uh, I, I, I don't think that, that I can really 
honestly call myself an expert because there's so much to know. There's so much to learn. I'm learning every day about this. It's a, it's a, it's an emerging field. Um, I feel like the people who, who are, uh, who also call themselves, and there are many people who call themselves experts oftentimes have their ideas made up around these things. And I have my own conclusions and we'll share them today. Um, or I'll share, share them today. Um, but, uh, but it is, it is something that is a constantly ever changing landscape and, Mm. um, and it, and it's fascinating. And I think maybe that's what, what, what appeals to me about this is that it, it, I'm a lifelong learner. Um, Mm. and so, so this is just the perfect place for me because this will never, this is a problem that will never be solved either. You know, um, if you really think about it, it's, this is a, this is a problem that will always be with us as long as, as long as we live in buildings and breathe air on planet earth. Uh, and even in space, by the way, because mold grows really well on the International Space Station. So, I mean, you, you know, it doesn't matter as long as we're in inside of a inside of a habitat uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, there will be there will be moisture problems and where there are moisture yeah. problems, there will be mold growth. And so it really is that fundamental. I mean, mold is as okay. basic as gravity as as mm-hmm. sunlight. So so I came to this from a very honest uh, um, you know, personal experience. You know, when I was four years old, I was falsely diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And lost, my, I had lost a lot of weight in a three-week period. So my parents uh, took me to Children's Hospital where I got that diagnosis. And that was that was both shocking to them and also in a way uh, not so surprising because it was in our family history. And so that was their worst nightmare coming mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, and so, uh, so fortunately, six weeks later, they got a, a second opinion. And actually, I had asthma compounded by pneumonia. And, and when they tested me for allergies, I was allergic to every single thing they tested me for. So it was grass, oh. wheat, corn, eggs, dogs, cats, cotton, even soybeans. And I was surrounded by uh, uh, fields of soybeans and, 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 of course, wearing cotton. I was itchy my whole childhood. And uh, when I was 12 years old, my folks split up, which was good for everyone involved, and uh, moved out of that, that musty farmhouse and all my symptoms went away. Um, it was chalked up to spontaneous adolescent remission, which is, I guess, a fancy word for a uh, fancy term for uh, we have no idea what the hell happened. <laughs> right, right. And uh, it is, you know, the levity of that, I mean, just letting that sit in the room for a moment of all of those conditions. How many parents do you think listening right now are looking at their own kid going, oh, crap. Does this actually just be mold? I mean, you just you just probably already have lit a fire under a few people to start to consider the environment in which they're living and breathing in on a regular basis. So, wow, just from the get go, thank you. Yeah, and, and actually, that's the thing about mold is that it is it, it it masquerades around as all these other things, right? So it 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 shows up or 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 brings out uh, latent symptom profiles um, mm-hmm. that. Uh, otherwise are sur- maybe simmering under the surface. And um, so as much as mold is blamed as is the, sor- the source of the disease, I think it's the aggravator of much mold. Um, that's at least what I've seen in, in my l- the last 21 years or so. Um, so, well, and, so- and you just start simply, like you make it sound like it really is so simple. And yet in all of my learnings and all my education seeking this information, Jason, it seems so complex and yet you already broke it down to sort of just like air, light, water, you know, uh, or um, how do you command the movement of water in your living environment? You know, like how, how does it show up? Like really break it down. You kind of gave us already this super simple funnel that we can go into to say, how does mold arrive, arise? Mold at its root is just a moisture problem. It, that's really all it is. So, but people always blame, they, they, they look at mold as the problem and mold is a symptom. Ah, uh. <laughs> mold is a symptom. So, so when we do mold assess, mold assessments, mold inspections, we're not actually looking for mold. We're looking for a moisture problem. Um, now mold can exist in buildings where there's no active moisture problem. So that might be a legacy issue. Um, and mm-hmm. so that's a good reason to do testing anyway, when, especially when people are presenting with, with, uh, with symptoms or, you know, whether occupant complaints, but, um, but by and large, what we do is we, when we find mold, that's, that's, then we backtrack to find out where that moisture problem is because that's root cause. So if you think about mold as root cause of illness, let's it's actually moisture problems as root cause of illness. Wow. Right. Wow. So, and then you go even further back. What we really have to do is look at, um, and this is kind of one of my favorite parts of this conversation is we have to look at our relationship with our buildings. Mm. 
So, so, you know, our, our buildings are a lot like bodies. Um, you know, they've got, you know, a long, they've got a respiratory system, our HVAC, they've got, you know, the circulatory systems is like the plumbing and the electrical systems, like the nervous system. And, and, uh, and so when buildings start to develop aches and pains, they, that shows up, uh, mm -hmm. usually the building starts to fail around how it sheds wind and water. And so water gets in. And next thing you know, I kind of think about that as like inflammation in the building, the water gets wow. in and the initial mold growth is like inflammation. Um, and if we leave that be, uh, then it becomes chronic inflammation, which is where you get the really nasty molds and the really significant issues that lead to the toxigenic species. And so, uh, you know, we all know that, you know, chronic inflammation is its own disease, uh, which leads to a whole uh, cascade of other potential issues. And so, um, so when, when buildings get sick, we get sick. Mm. And then when buildings heal, uh, it gives us the opportunity to heal. So if it, you have to start there, really, Right. So this is sort of a, um, you know, recognizing that that we have a symbiotic relationship with our buildings. They're really like an extension of our immune system, um, wow. like an exoskin or an exoskeleton. And, and so if we can raise the awareness around that, then, you know, you recognize that maintenance of your building is a lot like taking care of yourself because it is a it is a uh, it's like the Matryoshka dolls, you know, the Russian stacking yes. dolls. Right. Yes. You know? wow. Oh, my gosh. I mean, right now, the the all of my neurons are firing very rapidly at this moment here. And you are speaking so my language. This is another reason and place where we connected is this concept of terrain inside and outside of us and how those interact. And the other piece that was near and dear is, you know, I was able to share with you a little bit about what we're building this hospital, you know, that we're building on a farm, you know, in essence, but the design around this hospital is we wanted to create a living matrix design, this biophilic design that allowed a healing space to to actually take what you just said and have an environment a build a lived in building environment actually be part of the healing process yes how and that it. interface right and yeah. so can you tell our listeners a little bit about what the heck we're talking about when we talk about biophilic design because i know this is one of your passions Sure. Well, bio is uh, is life and philia is love. And so really, we're talking about bringing in, you know, the love of, of life uh, into the buildings. And so, you know, uh, the three enemies of a healthy building really are a moisture problem, which, of course, leads to mold growth, but also the proliferation of allergens and and eventually decay, rot. I mean, a moisture problem takes a building down. Right. So a moisture mm -hmm. problem can kill a building. Um, and then there's also chemicals, which is a major problem. Um, nice. And so we all VOCs, we, and we can get into that a little bit more later because it's hard to talk about mold and air quality without talking about VOCs and chemicals because they're, they're yes. it's like a Thank diagram. You. And that's where the overload really occurs in modern structures. Um, I wow. think they, they amplify each other greatly. And of course, you know, when we're talking about cancer, to, talk, to, leave, the, to leave VOCs out of the conversation would be. You yeah. Know, yeah. Would be would be, would be, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, or, you know, just major omission. And then the third thing that I think is, is, is a, is a, is a huge issue is the hyper sanitization uh, oh, of our buildings, yes. you know, which is also tied to chemicals in a different way where we have this idea that we need to kill everything in order for us to live. Uh, and you know, the, the, the reality is only about a hundred, uh, uh, bacterial species actually are, are, are known to cause severe human illness, which is kind of wild um, when you think about the fact that people basically say bacteria is bad in general. So in, in other words, the idea here is to invite life into your building and in in, in have a, a, a robust, not just virgin green background, but actually to allow for uh, a microbial diversity. And that would that 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 is largely driven by having um, by having plants and soil and uh ventilation and you know you know air exchange from with healthy outside air um and all of these things all done in such a way that the out the indoor environment reflects largely a healthy outdoor environment right so mm -hmm. the the idea that that kind of strikes me is the word human uh actually comes from humus which is soil yes yes right and so and and we we are so uh, disconnected from that. Now we put rubber on the bottom of our feet and we wash mm -hmm. our vegetables. We don't have any dirt on your fruits and vegetables, right? Um, you know, we, we, we've, we've destroyed this idea of what, what clean really means. Uh, people mm -hmm. think clean means sterile now, uh, instead of free of dirt and debris. And so the idea of bringing nature back into our buildings so that we can then, um, 
operate better within our, our space on a natural basis, you know, so we're not stuck in these hermetically sealed chemical boxes that get moldy really quickly when they get wet. Um, oh gosh. And, wow. uh, and so, and, and bringing in, listen, the, the reality is that we breathe oxygen and, and we separate ourselves from the very creation, the, 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 uh, the living, um, um, the living elements that, that create that oxygen. Right. So, so, you know, there, we, we, we need to start really looking at how we have slowly separate ourselves. So separate ourselves from nature. I mean, over the course of the history of human species, we spent 99.9% .9 of that time outside. Right. And, right. And then 0.01% maybe, I mean, who knows whether it's 0 0.01, 0 0.02, but, but an infinitesimally small fraction of that time we've spent indoors and then look what's happened in that time. We've had skyrocketing rates of asthma, allergies, autoimmune disease, cancer, right. autism. And to say that that's not related, I think, uh, would be uh, would be um, willful ignorance. You know, mm, that's huge. Well, and it's it's interesting because there's even I mean, there's study after study after study about just air quality itself as a known carcinogen. Um, and that's not even looking at. First of all, that's studies looking at outside air. So like industrial pollutants, wood, you know, firewood, you know, wood smoke from wildfires, those types of things. No one really questions those, right? They kind of go, yeah, it's probably not good to be, you know, living near a paper factory, you know, a paper mill or, you know, snorting all the smoke from the fires, you know, disseminating our forests and whatnot. We can kind of get our mind around that, but folks really are clueless about their indoor airspace. And so this is the place where, you know, you kind of alluded to, you can't not talk about the interface between this, what do I want to say? This sort of fabricated living environment to the, you know, how far away from nature it has become and the chemicals and the constituents that have made it so toxic and its interface with these water problems that lead to mold problems as the symptom. And so I think that's one element I want to unpack a little bit more, but there was just, there was just so much about this. Like I really love that you're creating awareness around, we are an extension of our environment and our, our environment is an extension of ourselves. And so granted most people on the planet um, may not have the financial resources and whatnot to do all the very high end expensive things, but there are some simple things you and I are going to talk about at the very end of this that is available for free for everybody that I know you're going to bring weave into the conversation. So I want people to kind of be thinking it's like, we're, we're going to, we're talking problems right now, but we will get to some solutions. Indeed. But right now this is about creating this curiosity and this awareness of maybe thinking about your living environment in a way you've never thought of it before. And specifically, so the other night on a call with my um, advocates, I was teaching about people asked a question about my discomfort of giving exogenous hormones. So talk about another truth bomb that really freaks people out. But to me, the, the issue like, like symptoms of hormonal deficiency are just that they're symptoms, but they're actually not really shining the light that we're hormonal deficient. We're circadian rhythm deficient. We're mm -hmm. not there. We're not uh, like matching our inside environment with our outside environment. We've gotten so disconnected. And I was literally telling the story about sort of the little house on the prairie days when we walked an average of four hours a day, we literally chopped wood, carried water. We spent the vast majority of our time outdoors. I never even thought about this piece that you just wove into the conversation about what were you exposed to when you walked through that threshold into that home that you just spent very, very little time in up until just recent times. So I am just really intrigued by this piece here because I think that we are all, myself included, hyper-focused on the symptom versus the cause of that symptom. And you are bringing us back to the awareness on such a profound way here. So anything else you'd add to that piece before we dive into like, what are some of the biggest myths of, around mold? Because I think we've already hit a couple just out and running on this talk. Yeah, so I, I think there are some really sort of amazing uh, statistics and concepts for people to get their mind around when it comes to indoor air. One is, uh, first of all, just the sheer amount that we breathe. You know, we breathe 13 to 15 times a minute, which comes mm -hmm. up to 20,000 times a day. And that's about 2,000 gallons, uh, which is enough to fill a swimming pool. 
Um, and if you do the, the math on this, and I've done it with my four-year-old son, um, <laughs> it comes up to about 30 pounds of air. Okay. So now if you drink eight glasses of water a day, you're only drinking about, uh, about four pounds of water. And if you uh, eat three full meals a day, which, you know, a lot of people with intermittent fasting are eating all this and that, uh, you, you may eat four pounds a day on the high end. And so, so you're talking about um, your, your air is your single largest environmental exposure by a long shot yet of the four basic human needs, air, water, food, shelter, um, you know, we, we can live without shelter for a long time. We can live without food for three weeks or so. We can live without water for a few days, but we can live without air for a few minutes and yet air is often an afterthought. And so, wow. so we have this weird thing, humans, where we take for granted the things and people that are closest to us, right? Uh, until, until, until there's a problem. And then suddenly we have this, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Well, when it's your breath, boy, that's a pretty critical issue. And yeah. so we don't usually notice if air is a problem until it smells bad, tastes bad, or there's not enough of it. And so you don't want to wait until that happens. And so the problem with air is that you often can't tell uh, if it's bad by taste or smell um, or, or, or um, you know, what you basically end up doing is be, being a filter of this stuff. And so... Um, what's fascinating also is that because we are living in these hermetically sealed boxes, um, and this is really, it's, it's like the proverbial boiling frog, you know, back in the old days, you talk about Little House on the Prairie, when the wind blew, the, the house whistled because there was no insulation in the walls and there was a lot of air exchange. And then we started, uh, you know, closing things up. Uh, and then we started building with synthetic materials and drywall, which is the, like the ideal substrate for mold growth. Um, and so that was really after World War II to, to make faster, cheaper houses. And then after the fuel crisis um, in the 60s, we began really sealing things up. And then we also began introducing petroleum-based uh, product building materials. Um, and so but com 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 you close it up and then put toxic materials in there. And so what we end up with is this idea that we're rebreathing the same air 20,000 times a day. And wow. so it, you don't have to have a high pollutant load for that to become a real problem. You have to look at, at air as either healthy or unhealthy. There's no neutral. There's, mm. This is a really important idea. There's no neutral. So if air is not healthy, clean, fresh, also uh, with the exception of uh, those who have a very severe compromised immune system, and of course that, 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 that is uh, many of your, your, your patients, uh, right. all of your patients probably, um, you have to be aware of that microbiome. But the point is that um, you're, you're either breathing healthy, nutritious, uh, air that is detoxifying and that is energizing, or you're breathing uh, air that is potentially deleterious, and there's no in between. Uh, and then when you're dealing with anywhere where there is outdoor air pollution, so any of the major cities, or if you're in proximity to a gas station, or there happens to be a source nearby, if that infiltrates into the building, which it will, the moment you ex put an exhaust vent on, air blows out, air comes in. Um, and so that's that you, you are introducing outdoor air into your home, whether you know it or not. And the stats on this are pretty fascinating, too. In outdoor air pollution that infiltrates indoors because of the rebreathing, you can be exposed to outdoor air pollution indoors four times more than you would if you were outside. Get your mind around that. Wow. Right. Is it because it's concentrating it at that point? And then it's because like, you're so rebreathing it. It's because, because so you can have a small, a, a relatively l low pollutant load in a building, but if you rebreathe it 20,000 times a day, think about that as 20,000 doses. And, and you're so changing it's the, the chemical structure going through your own circulatory system. You're actually turning it into other chemical compounds. At, and you're, at you're metabolizing it, right? You're, you, wow. you, you, you don't really breathe air so much as we consume it, right? Mm, so, wow. you, know, we, you know, you have to look at this as we, this is, this is our, if, um, if we were fish, this is our water. Um, and so there, we're, we're filtering this stuff out and, um, and, and we are consuming it. And so, um, so it, it, the, the air awareness is, is the first step, right? Getting people to recognize that this is, um, it's obviously vital, but it's a, it is the last frontier of environmental awareness. People know you should eat healthy food and drink clean water, but air for some reason is just now getting its day in the sun you know, uh, mm. which is great. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good time to be in this, in this space because people actually care about their air. I think probably because of COVID, uh, yeah. you know, the, the yes. awareness around that was just, you know, and, and 
And Oliver Wendell Holmes said that a mind stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. And so I believe uh, that we are actually that that's a good thing because our society will never retrench from that. Uh, it only gets better from here. Cool. Oh, there's so a little bit of hope on the horizon with conversations like this, because now we might be, like you said, air awareness, getting getting the awareness. That's how all these campaigns start. Right. And then right. we start to look at um, t- assessing the situation like, OK, where where there's probably a problem. Let's look a little bit deeper. And then what are we going to do about it? And so in that piece here, you and I talked last time about the concept of how you test for mold. And it seems like one of the biggest mythologies that are out there in this arena is, is the, well, I'll let, I'll let you run with this because this is a tricky conversation. So mm-hmm. when a person wakes up to this and has air awareness and knows that that could be a compromising their health, their, their environment, their children's health, whatever. Like they go out there to be like, I'm going to test my environment. I'm going to test my body. Tell us why that may not be as easy as it seems. Yeah. I mean, to all the practitioners listening, bu- bu- buckle your seatbelt because I know this is where, when we talked, I was like, Oh crap, here we go. Yeah. This is, <laughs> yeah. This is never very well received. And, and it's also, yeah. um, and, and only because there aren't really very many uh, alternatives to it, which is one of the big reasons this is a problem. So mycotoxin urine panels are are uh, very popular. They're like in vogue these days. Yeah. And um, and so everyone- I, I use them all the time. And so you made me rethink that after our conversation. I think they're useful if you understand how to how to interpret the data, right? Like I think that's the case with almost all tests. Um, understanding uh, what, ha- what what tests are prone to false negatives and false positives, understanding what a false negative really is and what a false positive really is. Um, and that's another conversation that would be fascinating for us to un- un- unpack a little bit of that. But when it comes to the mycotoxin urine panels, um, when, when mold, gr- first of all, there are uh, roughly 100,000 species, about 100 are known to produce mycotoxins. Um, and so uh, so the, the idea that mycotoxins are the basis for all mold related illness is to suggest that the other 99,900 don't matter. Whew. Yeah. So that, that, that doesn't seem logical on its face. You don't have to be a, a mold specialist to, to, to realize that, that might not be a logical conclusion. So, so, so bringing this back down to sort of like, you know, sixth grade science class, when, when mold grows, it produces three things, mold spores, which are the sort of hardy reproductive capsules, seed like capsules that that, that go forth and multiply, right? Carrying the genetic material. <laughs> yes. um, and then, and so they can cause allergic reactions. They also can carry trace amounts of mycotoxins and the mycotoxins are these, um, that's the second thing the molds produce and they only produce them intermittently. Even the mycotoxin producing molds don't produce them all the time. Uh, they produce them when they're threatened um, or when they're, when they're sort of environmental challenges. So like when they're drying out, sometimes they'll produce them to sort of protect their fiefdom uh, so that when, <laughs> So that there's no, you know, it's all about competition, right? These are just yeah. chemical weapons used at a microscopic level and we get caught in the crosshairs. Um, and so- They're just trying uh, for their own survival, really, that's ultimately. It, that's it, And they're not trying to hurt us. Listen, like, that's the other thing. Like mold is not the enemy here, people. You know, like that, that's the most, that mold is actually just doing its thing. And without mold, we'd be being in big trouble. Um, you know, there was a period where we didn't have fungi and all the trees fell down and they didn't rot. And that's why we have oil and coal. And that was the carboniferous period. So, so fungi and mold are our friends, right? Except for when they're growing in our home, that's the deal. Um, you know, uh, so, so we got, we got spores, uh, which are, you know, which are a- abundant in every environment. So, uh, and don't, don't be afraid of spores. Uh, kingdom fungi produces 50 megatons every year, which is the equivalent of 500,000 blue whales. Um, it's the most abundant particulate uh, producer on the planet. Uh, 25 times as much tea as is drank every year by the entire planet is how much you know, fungi produces in spores. Um, so you're not going to get away from those. Uh, it, the mycotoxins are a very small subset. The mycotoxin producing molds are a very small subset of, of all microfungi. Um, and, uh, and yet they are blamed for all mold related illness, which is a completely false narrative. And then the third thing that is completely um, like ignored or overlooked when it comes to mold related illness is the musty smell, yeah. uh, the, the microbial gases. And you have to think about the idea that uh, the, the musty smell um, is produced by all molds during active growth, 
right? So at the first phase of growth, which can occur in as little as 24 to 48 hours of a moisture problem, mold will begin to metabolize or eat, digest what it's growing on. Uh, and that can be something as simple as household dust, or it can be the paper on your sheetrock or whatever, whatever it is made of things that were one time living. Mold's job is to turn dead things back into dirt. And so it will do that with anything in your house that is comprised of something that was at one time living. And so as it's metabolizing or eating this stuff, it's digesting outside because it doesn't have a stomach. And so it's releasing enzymes and the gases that it produces, much like we produce gas. Uh, and by the way, those gas, the gases we produce are also microbial VOCs because we don't really produce our own gases. Um, we're kind of like ambulatory composters. You know what I mean? We're, we don't really... <laughs> <laughs> a compost pile of bugs. I got gotcha. yeah, you. Exactly. So, so we are, we, we are, we are, we are, and we are microbial, by the way, which is a, another tangent that we can go, um, mm -hmm. go down. But so what you have is this, this, uh, all molds producing the musty smell, um, and, and, and the, uh, immune responses that are caused by the musty smell are, are not to be, uh, not to be, uh, it's nothing to sneeze at, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> but I'm bummed. So, so, <laughs> So we all know that VOCs, volatile organic compounds, uh, are, are generally speaking uh, uh, man-made. Uh, however, there are microbial VOCs, and that's what this is, MVOCs. So MVOCs are um, sort of a potpourri of industrial solvents. So alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, um, you know, there are uh, other sort of like telltale industrial solvents that are actually found growing from um, actively growing mold, like toluene and benzene has actually been found coming off of yeah. the biofuels wow. are produced by microbial growth. And so we know that those are combustible and those are pretty, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put those in your Cheerios. Um, and so, uh, so we don't want to be breathing that stuff. Now, uh, Dr. Joan Bennett at Rutgers University has done some really beautiful research around this stuff. And uh, she actually had a mold exposure down in New Orleans in her house mm -hmm. after Katrina uh, came through. And uh, she went in wearing a respirator to, to sort of recover some of her personal belongings and to, to, to document the damage. And being an ever curious fungal geneticist, mold researcher, she wanted to uh, do some testing in her own house. And she had to leave several times because the musty smell was coming through the respirator, uh, which is Ooh. only there, you know, N95 only stops particles, it doesn't stop gases. And so uh, she became yeah. sick and she was also at that point fascinated by the idea that uh, she was getting sick by something, but she wasn't being, she was getting sick from something that wasn't uh, spores or mycotoxins that would be wow. stopped by the filter. So she went back to her lab and started researching the musty smell and uh, identify or, or isolated one compound, which is, which is common in most, most uh, musty environments, which is one octane three all, it's a mushroom alcohol. And uh, she began doing some basic science experiments around uh, with, uh, fruit flies and uh, some, some, um, some, some plants. And so she exposed the fruit flies and the plants to this, to this component of the musty smell. And the uh, fruit flies uh, uh, stop producing dopamine. They uh, start flying down and set it to the light. They stop reproducing. They develop uh, locomotor dysfunction, um, mitochondrial damage, uh, and of course, you know, premature death. And so she, uh, once she, she actually is lobbying to have uh, microbial VOCs instead of being sort of classified as a non mycotoxin, she wants to call them volatoxins. Um, so essentially, she found out that they're neurotoxic. Um, this is this is powerful stuff. Uh, because you what we have is a is a is a compound produced by all, all almost all uh, actively growing molds. I'm not saying one octan three isn't produced by all molds all the time, but it is a very common component of the musty smell, um, and it is disregarded as a as a component in mold related illness. And yet it is uh, it's abundant, and it is um, and it is and it is yeah. a uh, and it's always airborne too because it's by nature of, it's a volatile compound. So it so our exposure mm -hmm. is not is is indisputable. Whereas with spores. And even the mycotoxins themselves, they don't become airborne easily, contrary to yeah. popular opinion. Interesting. Um, and so, so this this is this is a this is a major issue um, that sort of shatters the idea that that uh, that mycotoxins are the primary cause of mold related illness. So, so when we when these panels come in, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just like I'm like letting this soak in before you talk about the panels. I just want you to go through that list of symptoms that you rattled off about, or the, the, the impact, like dop blocking dopamine, things like that. Can you just rattle that again? Because I want this to land because it will probably make you look at yourself and the person sitting next to you listening and like, interesting. 
these are yeah. a lot of the symptoms I'm carrying or somebody else's. Yeah, well, we, we think about VOCs. You know, what's the most common VOC out there? The most popular VOC is alcohol. And how does that present usually? Well, it's co it, it, it creates cognitive impairment, and we do this electively, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> other VOCs also cause cognitive impairment, um, and and so, but we don't we don't connect the dots on these things. We just this oh, is one okay. that this is fun one, and this is the one that's not so fun. So when when you're talking about the musty smell, these are VOCs, and they and they impact us in many different ways. The the first, the most potent one, the thing that makes that, that hits home for me is that is the fact that they, the fruit flies stop producing dopamine. Um, that's so huge. Become, that's right. the one. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. They become depressed. And and by the way, as a, as a personal aside, um, you know, the musty house that I grew up in is the same home that my mother committed suicide in two years after, after the divorce. And of course she was an alcoholic and, you know, these things are complex and no one can really, you know, separate, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, what actually was the underlying cause? I'm sure it was cumulative, but she was, and she was also an alcoholic. So who knows what she was self-medicating against. Um, but I certainly, uh, in retrospect, see that this couldn't have helped. And, and also, by the way, Brown University did an interesting study in 2008 and found a strong correlation between uh, mold and dampness indoors and depression. 6,000 participants in the study, so not a small study. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea that, uh, again, that, that mycotoxins are causing all this illness, it literally ignores all of that data. Um, and so, so, they, they stop producing dopamine. They fly down and set it to the light, which means that they've lost their instinctive nature. Um, which that's is a big deal. So our, like this just also speaks volumes to our culture. Mm. I just think that's so interesting. We're like locking ourselves up from the light. We're locking ourselves off from each other. We're dopamine addicted by picking up our phones and, you know, eating our sugars and grabbing our drugs or dealing with our porn or shopping, you know, consume, consume, consume. Like this is, this is massive, Jason, yes. what you're speaking to here, it's massive. And so it is one of those places when someone's like, I've done all the things in my health and something's not getting, not improving like you have to be looking at this you've got to be looking at your 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 air quality you have to yeah it's so air food and attitude um but when we you know that's it, it's it's it, it's and you and you can't do uh you can't leave one of them out uh exactly. because they're they're yeah. they're 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 required linked. each other yeah they're and you're linked. going to be telling us soon how food is even linked to this maybe more so than we give it credit for as well which i'm excited about because that's another big truth bomb that's i think overlooked in our in our medical community for sure and that's that's actually one of the things that they don't want to talk about because it's so hard to actually navigate and so you know if you if you're told that a lot of people just shut down so that this is you know that's why i said buckle your seatbelts because there's a lot a lot of this stuff is is is, is a bitter pill to swallow um, but it, but it's necessary because this is where change begins, you know, conversations like this. And, and, and so, um, so yeah, so the, so and by the way, we've, you know, the fruit flies fly down and they lose their instinctive nature. Well, we, we've lost our instinctive nature to, to a large degree. Right. And so, um, so they become, they, the, this neurotoxicity, right. That she, she said she actually characterized it in her paper, by the way, which is called silver linings. Uh, it's written in a memoir style. Anyone who's interested, I can drop the, I can, we can uh, drop the link. It's beautiful. Joan's just, she's a good, very good friend of mine. Um, and uh, in fact, when she, when she, when she uh, I met her because she, she read about uh, me and my mold sniffing dog Oreo uh, back in 2004. And she invited me up to her lab. She called and she said, I read about you and your dog. I'd like to meet your dog. It's okay if you come too. Uh, <laughs> I love her already just for that. <laughs> she's, she's fabulous. She's, she's a dear friend. Um, and so, uh, so she, uh, you know, what, what she, what she has essentially highlighted here is that, um, that, oh no, she, what she said was that there was a Parkinsonian like symptoms. That's how she described the, wow. uh, the, the, uh, the fruit flies, um, uh, physiological response. And, and so when they stop reproducing too, so, you know, I'd like, like to know hallmark of depression. Um, and, you know, so the whole thing is really not surprising. And by the way, they stop reproducing. We, we, you know, we all know that we're, we're having uh, reproductive issues in our society, yeah, right? Yeah, Major yeah, yeah, problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're also set, we're also becoming more and more silos, social, social breakdown. And so all of these things seem, you know, very sort of, you know, there seems like a lot of parallels. Um, and so it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff and it's also uh, completely preventable. Th that's the thing, you know, th this There's is the hope. thing about 
Mold related illness, most of it's completely preventable because moisture problems uh, can, if people realize how quickly mold grows, they'd act more quickly when they have a moisture problem. And they, you know, this is, this is when something gets wet and stays wet for more than a few days, it gets moldy. And so, and the first thing that happens is the musty smell. And so uh, you don't have to wait a long time. In fact, a long time is 48 hours with this stuff, you know? Um, so, so that's, that's my, th these are my words of wisdom here is if you see something, smell something or feel something, do something and do it quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, because you don't have time to waste. And if you do it quickly, usually it's free or cheap or insurance will pay for it. And if you wait three days, insurance won't pay for it. Now it's a cash pay. And now you're up, you know, what Creek without a paddle. And so, um, so, so this is, this is, this is crucial stuff. Um, and, and it's, uh, and it's insidious too, because our sense of smell tends to get numb, uh, pretty quickly. So if you don't leave the house, like most of us don't anymore, because we're, you know, post COVID working from home and, and, you know, you can, you can become, um, you can become numb to this. And, 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 and then the very thing that's causing you illness actually causes you to stay in the building that's causing you illness. Wow. It you know what I mean? Horrible and, cycle. and it's a, it's a, it's a really negative cycle. And, and so we see this a lot on Facebook groups where these people are sort of crippled by their illness and they can't leave the house or they don't leave the house, but that's the thing that's making them sick. And so, um, so I encourage people to, to, uh, to get their stuff clean and open the bloody windows, you know, yes. get out, get some sunshine, get outside and walk. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how these simple things can give you some perspective. And then you can walk back in and you, and, and, and tune back into your senses and go, wait, mm. this doesn't quite smell right. You know, this doesn't quite feel right. Um, and by the way, the other smell is the new house smell. Watch out for that. Well, you know, the new house, new car smell, um, you know, I, that used to be a, something that, that was appealing to me until I, until I, uh, got into this business. And now when I smell it, I smell autoimmune disease. I smell cancer. Right. Um, exactly. Because that's all VOCs. Yeah. That's all the off gassing of those VOCs. And so now you alluded to earlier, the interface between these micro, you know, these mold micro VOCs and our living environment VOCs, my understanding, and you explained this to me, and I've heard it elsewhere, they sort of compound each other or, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Like they, they make it, they make it, what's the word I'm going for here? Like they make it worse when they come no, they have, Yeah, no doubt. Well, so, so the body doesn't, you know, um, there, the body doesn't know the difference between a microbial VOC and a man-made VOC. And what's really common with this stuff is you get a big mold exposure and then you develop a chemical sensitivity. You see this all the time. Yeah. Or you see people that have a chemical sensitivity and they just can't be around mold. Well, this also uh, further supports this idea that the microbial VOCs are a major underlying causal factor, or at least an aggravator in, in these illnesses, because the, if, if, if these things are interplaying, where are they interplaying? At what level? Well, the, the one commonality here is the, is the, is the VOC, right? Um, and so it's like a Venn diagram. Um, and the other thing that's really fascinating, and then we can get into the, the panels and, and so, some of the, the, the false narratives around that, is... Um, is how, how is it that people are, are, are actually getting sick from this stuff? And, and the, the research that I'm really digging into now that is most fascinating uh, revolves around um, the cranial nerve, specifically the trigeminal nerve. Wow. Um, in the face, um, they've got, you've got this, this uh, three-pronged set of nerves that have um, the trigeminal nerve that, with nerve endings in the eyes, jaw, and mouth. And the... Um, it handles primarily uh, uh, heat, cold, and pain, um, but the nerve endings are also really sensitive to uh, uh, VOCs and to toxins, and specifically pungent VOCs uh, that mm -hmm. are actually irritants of the trigeminal nerve. And so um, if you are sensitized and you can become sensitized very easily with this stuff, because we're living in the same buildings, we're never we're the same, you know, 20,000 times a day, the whole same, same thing. We're getting constantly exposed to this stuff. This, and it plays right alongside of the olfactory sense. So the trigeminal nerve and the olfactories are share information. Um, and, but the trigeminal nerve is able to detect these toxins below the odor threshold. So, so you don't necessarily have to be able to smell it, but you got this spidey sense. And this is an evolutionary tool that, that can work against you. Um, because once you become sensitized and these nerve endings become irritated, they will wow. send a cascade of inflammatory signals down and they can trigger cytokine storms 
which is also what's uh, underlying a, a lot of the lime based inflammation and mold related inflammation. So, uh, so what looks like inflammation due to toxicity, uh, it, it may very well simply be a sensory nerve irritation and an inflammatory response. So when people talk about chronic inflammatory response syndrome, something that Dr. Richard Schumacher uh, yeah, coined, yeah. Um, this is, they always look at, and when I say always, any conversation you have about this, that people will talk about mycotoxins, um, but, but they don't talk about uh, VOCs and MVOCs. And, right. and, and this, is, this is the big missing link in my opinion. And it's the trigeminal nerve uh, interaction that, that triggers this response. And you want to, everyone wants to go on a detox protocol and they want to take a pill, potion, powder, or, you know, whatever to get I rid of this. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and the most important thing is to get the environment straight. And then oftentimes the thing that actually solves this is neural retraining and, 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 uh, and, and things that is somatic work, the things that actually get your, ner your nervous system to the point where it's not having that overactive sort of PTSD type of response. Like um, a rewire the, yeah. the neural, the nerve, um, the neuronal, the neuronal behaviors at that point, yeah. because yeah. you're, you make it sound like, and this is what I'm really taking home here is like, once this gets activated, it will so be easily activated, no matter where you go. If you get out of your home, you go to a hotel, you go to a friend's house, you go somewhere else. It's just like, you're constantly in that place. That's and right. So that's what you're like, once you clean up your own environment, you got to clean up this environment and Bingo. retrain those nerves to respond differently. Yeah. Wow. And it, it really is a sort of a, have the, the same way that, that you handle PTSD, which is where you look at the thing that caused the trauma and, 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 and you realize, okay, this is not going to kill me. I can look at it again, you know, small exposures, even to the idea of it. Cause a lot of people really, they, they become afraid of mold, afraid of this, afraid of that. And, and, and there, I've never seen anybody get better when they're afraid. And the only way to, to, to reel this back in is to get to the point where you realize, Hey, listen, mold's a normal part of, of every healthy environment. Uh, to be afraid of mold is to be afraid of gravity or sunlight. It's a part of nature. It, it's 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 not practical. It doesn't it it doesn't have any. There's no equity there, right? Um, and and it, it, it and it's sensitized to the point where yes, it, it doesn't know the difference between the man-made stuff and the and the and the and the biological stuff. And so you know you're going to go into the hardware store and you're going to have a problem. You're going to go into the dry cleaner or the nail salon or wherever the hotels. Forget it because they have mold and chemicals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Right. So, so, so this is, this is the, 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 the research coming out around the trigeminal nerve and, and it's, in, and it's uh, the interface, no pun intended. It's in our face um, is, this. is literally um, the, it is, it, it is the, it is an evolutionary advantage that turns inside out on us, so to speak. Wow. And then you have to reel it back in again. And so, you know, there's great stuff. There's DNRS, uh, uh, primal mm -hmm. trust, uh, Dr. Kat yeah. King uh, is doing fabulous work. Um, and so, you know, th this is the kind of stuff that I think has the potential to, once you've gotten your air and food together, and we'll talk about food in a minute, uh, then, then attitude, right? And, and when I say attitude, it's not like you just wake up one day and, oh, we're just going to have affirmations. No, this is work. <laughs> You're not going to Pollyanna over it. Yeah. No, it no, no. It's not like you have to like, and there's no mold, there's no mold. No, this is, this is the real deal. You have, this is going to take work. And there, but there are tools and resources out there. Wow. Wow. And wow. And I just want to highlight something you said in this because it's so critical. Can you repeat what you said about fear, please? Oh, well, first of all, you'll never, you'll never get better until you believe you can, first of all. Um, and, and also I've never seen anybody get better. That's afraid of, 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 uh, mold or afraid. Um, and I think that's just it. It's like, I just wanted the word afraid because, because that's what I see in my world that fear in the cancer space is very, very prolific. Oh yeah. Right? And it is nearly impossible. Actually, I would say it is impossible to bring corrective optimal healing into an environment that's revving from a fear space. And so you could be throwing the best of whatever treatment, you could be changing up the environment outside of you, inside of you, you could be doing all the things, but if you are coming from a place of fear, whatever therapies you bring on board will not do that, will not do anything. And so I just thought that was so powerful that you brought this in because this goes beyond the mold conversation. This goes into every conversation and you're speaking down to its spidey senses and its neurological wiring and its belief system wiring that perpetuates a condition. And until you rewire that and you get out of your own way, you'll unfortunately be meeting more and more of the same things you're trying to resist and, and trying exactly. to resist out of a fear place. So, wow, Jason, that was massive. 
No doubt about it. No, I mean, listen, I, I the to to disregard the emotional component of illness is is uh, um, uh, it's again it's you know, it's, it's the willful ignorance because you can you 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 know it by the way intuitively we all know it right we we all this is this is the turmoil um and 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 it's and it's hard to turn that around sometimes but but this is not something that you need to do alone also uh, that, that there are this is a well traveled path uh and and so you know the idea like like most things you 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 can't do it alone you shouldn't do it alone um and 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 the resources are you know like I said DNRS is is great but um, but but the work that Cat King at, at uh, Primal Trust is doing uh, has taken it up a, a few notches and so I'd highly recommend anyone who's concerned about this who wants to get their uh, nervous system uh, it back into into tune um, and start thinking more about you know getting into more of a state of of love and acceptance instead of fear um, and um, uh, and dysrhythm. Uh, okay. This is this is again. We're talking about really. Uh, we're talking about our relationship with nature yeah. uh, when we're talking about mold, and we're talking about our buildings have disconnected us from nature, and so all of this stuff comes back down to like really basic ideas um, that are sort of clouded by you know our busyness and clouded by all this other stuff. But, Back but and, you know, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's 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 all very complex. But at the end of the day, these are very simple concepts. Um, and, and again, the good news is, and there's a lot of good news around this is that 20 years ago, when I first started doing this mulch, you know, people, people, people dismissed it. I think people were like, what are you, what, what are you doing? What, what kind of industry, what mulch, yeah. mole, 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 mole. I was there. I was right there with them. Um, and now everyone understands that this stuff is bad. Uh, or at least everyone understands that this, that this stuff can cause you illness. I shouldn't say it's even bad because it's, yeah. it is not bad. Uh, right. It is. It it's is, not out to get us. <laughs> it's not out to get us. Mold, mold, is, mold is not trying to kill you. Um, in fact, I would even I would even assert that the musty smell that comes uh, that 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 comes from initial the initial water damage is actually a pain. Like I said, it's inflammation in the building. It's like a pain signal. It's actually um, potentially the building sending you a signal or the mold sending you a signal saying, "Hey, there's an imbalance here." Yeah, yeah. attention here. Right now, if it really wanted to kill you, mold's pretty. Mold's got a lot of intelligence, and, and it's been around for a long time. It's got a lot more time and resources on its hands. It's got better chemicals and weapons too. If it really wanted to kill you, you'd be dead already. I assure you. Um, you know, so so it's it's actually signaling to you when you get that musty smell that there's something wrong. And if you don't listen to it, it's like ignoring pain in your body. You know, it will eventually manifest as something more significant. So listen to the signals that your body gives you. Listen to the signals that you're building gives you. Mm, so beautiful. So beautiful. And where do we begin in testing for this? That's not BS testing. Cause that's what I'm, that's what I'm concerned about is it's like, how do we start to explore this? And maybe, you know, one of the conversations you and I had last time is like, maybe we should put less attention on testing versus attention on healing the environment or preventing it from the get go. Yes. Um, so, so testing is complex. A lot of people recommend ERMI, uh, uh, which is a dust test. It's actually not even a test. It's a, a research tool developed by an EPA staffer that looks for 36 molds, 36 species out of 100,000 species. Um, and so it's extremely narrow and it's also prone, wildly prone to false positives. Uh, so it scares the crap out of people and often leads to a cascade of, of ex expensive inspections and unnecessary investigative demolition and stuff like that. Um, because of the fact that people want a silver bullet with testing, they want one test, right? Imagine if there was one test for the body that tells you if you've got, you know, it's just not realistic, right? If you want to test for cancer, how many tests are there for cancer? I mean, you have imaging, you got blood, you've got physical, you've got, you know, there's, there's, there's so many different ways. And if you just do blood, you're going to miss a lot of cancer. If you just do imaging, you're going to miss a lot. If you just do a physical, you're going to miss a lot. The building is no different. You need to look at this in a multifaceted approach. So, so it, even if you do, do testing on your own, you still need to look for evidence of moisture. You still need to use your nose. You still need to think about the building history. Have you had leaks, floods, water damage? You still need to think about symptom profiles. Is it getting better when you leave the building? All of these things are essentially the same as, you know, just like if you're dealing with a workup for a physical for your own body, right? You're doing a physical or workup for the building. And so uh, we developed a, a mold test, uh, that uses spore traps. And so it looks for airborne mole spores. It's one 
tool in the arsenal of other cool. tools, right? Um, there are also, uh, and, and so, we'll, and we'll, we'll drop a link uh, at the end uh, to, uh, yep. to our website about that. Um, and we can talk more about that uh, later. But there's also uh, tests for the VOCs and for the musty smell. Uh, another test that, that you know, will, will show another facet of the indoor air. And so when you start layering these things on, then you start to get a picture. But there's no single data point, whether it be right. an Ernie right. test, a spore right. trap, a VOC test, or even uh, even the the you know a must. None of those things are actionable on their own. They need to have the context of what's going on in the in the environment. So that's one of the reasons why we created an ebook, the How to Find Mold. Yes. Um, and yeah. so this walks you through your home with inspection checklists and FAQs, and 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 gives you sort of the it slows you down a little bit so that you will take a, a walk through your own home, the same way if you were to give yourself a little mole exam, you know, like you look around, you, know, you want to take the time to do that sometimes, right? And so the same thing with your building. Um, and then when you find areas of concern where there's, you know, musty smell, there's some evidence of moisture, you might find water bugs, that's a big red, red flag, you know, uh, these kinds of things, then you might consider using a test like ours, the Got Mold Test Kit, um, and, uh, and, and then you'll start to be able to collect air samples and, um, and, and determine whether or not there are abnormal spore counts, which could be reflective of a, of a mold problem um, yes. and, or, or, or any one of the other resources that we, uh, that we uh, talk and promote uh, in the ebook, by the way. Um, so such an amazing resource, Jason. I'm so grateful to have a place to send people to say, where do I begin? How do I start to look at this? And I love that you're putting it back into their control, put it into their responsibility and their, um, you know, autonomy to take, to, you know, measures in their own hands and not spend a fortune bringing in an inspector. They can start the inspecting process themselves. Yeah, start we to, want to empower people. Things. Yeah, we 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 we're here to empower people with the tools and knowledge they need to uh, make better decisions about the air they breathe. Um, and so, uh, but, but, it, but it, it is a, it is a, uh, one step at a time process. Uh, there's, like I said, there's no silver bullets. Uh, and, and, and also I should mention this, and this is a really important point. Um, and, and if we have time, I would love to chat more about the, the, uh, the mold and the food. Um, yes, but, yeah. but, but when it comes to tests, it's really important to realize that like there's Petri dishes that are, that are very popular too. Um, they oh, they're always positive, always positive because mold spores are abundant and they always grow on petri dishes. Um, so, so if you if you have a test that's prone to false positive, that's a very dangerous data point because mm -hmm. false positives will send you down rabbit holes. They will lead to you maybe hiring inspectors that will that will also leverage that data and and remediators who will leverage that data into procedures that may or may not be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to tests that show and not detected. For example, spore traps like ours may have no, nothing may be detected in that. When you may actually have a musty smell, you may have water damage. That doesn't, that's not a false negative, even though it, it, what it actually is, it shows you the nature of the mold problem. You might have mold growing in the wall. Spores aren't coming through, uh, but the musty smell is. Now we already know the musty smell can make you sick. It didn't, that's not a false negative. That's actually helping you characterize the nature of the mold problem. And in those Got cases, it. you're gonna wanna bring in a professional to do the investigative work to find out where that source of moisture is. So understanding how to interpret data is one of the trickiest parts of this, yeah. um, but, but it's important to realize that there's a lot of confirmation bias when it comes to testing, people want the Petri, they, they get the Petri dishes, positive, see, I told you, right? The ERMI <laughs> test, I told you. And this also rolls up to practitioners who are in the business of uh, of making money too, of course. And so in some cases they will, they will uh, you know, this perpetuates the next visit, right? When I have a high reading and then you have a mycotoxin panel and that's a high reading. Well, gosh, if you got a high ERMI and a high mycotoxin panel, you got a problem. Well, I'm here to tell you that everybody <laughs> We'll have a high mycotoxin panel uh, in, well, not everybody, but almost everybody uh, will have, unless you're not excreting well. If you eat at restaurants and, and, and you're in modern America, you probably are eating uh, mycotoxin contaminated food to some degree. And so therefore yeah. you will be excreting them and they will show up in your panel. And almost every single ERMI test is high. And if you, if you misinterpret that data and then daisy chain them together, Garbage in, garbage out. Confirmation bias. Well, then next thing you know, wow. you're down. You're 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 in a funnel of uh, remediators and inspectors, and you may or may not have a problem. 
Um, but it's yeah. but then you go back and you're not getting better um, because the reality is is that the mycotoxin panel is actually reflecting your food. I mean, 99% of that I think is is food related. And the ermy, you're almost never going to get a clean ermy. Um, and so so then that's just that's like there's a cascade of of, of mm. disappointment and additional unnecessary work around that. It's very yeah. complex stuff. Yeah. So so those false positives that from the panels. And by the way, it's not really a false positive. It's telling you that you're eating badly. Um, right, right, exactly. It, you know? Exactly. Because they do, when you look at the, as a clinician, you look at the result, like the interpretation section, and it'll say, yes, you can get this from water damaged buildings, but here's also where it's found. Agriculture, grains, you know, legumes, nuts, seeds, coffee, wine, like suddenly you realize this is the massive food, you know, systems of our developed nations. You know, I mean, it's it hits you really quickly that that list is extensive and it's not solely coming from your home. And I think no. that's a piece that is huge for you to bring to to light. Yeah, no, it's, and, it, it's, and it's also conventional meats and dairy. So check this out. What this are they huge. feeding cows if they're not or grass fed? What do they feed? They're feeding them moldy grains. Moldy grains, exactly. Right? So not only are we also getting the glyphosate and the hormones and the antibiotics and the uh, you're getting the moldy grain piece, which means mycotoxins on, on mycotoxins on mycotoxins or VOCs, Absolutely. the whole thing. Ooh. Yeah, you're getting the whole thing. And it's just like mercury rolls up the food chain, right? Uh, yeah. so mycotoxins do too. They're, they're lipophilic. And so they, they stick in fats. And of course, dairy is a lot of fat. And so it goes right on through. And they're also uh, heat resistant, so you can't cook them out. And they're, uh, and they're also uh, hydrophobic, which means that they don't excrete well. So you're, so they get lodged in your fat cells. They don't cook out. I mean, you know, this stuff is, it's durable stuff. I mean, um, and so, so yeah, and it's, it's imported grains, nuts, seeds, coffee, tea, spices, um, you know, the list is long, but like anytime you go to a restaurant, if it does not say organic, local, seasonal, uh, grass fed, pastured, you know what it is. And it's filled with the long list of other pollutants. And then you can also add mycotoxins in there. We get wow. uh, people calling us all the time with uh, high mycotoxin panels. And they want it, they want us to, to, to um, find the mold that's producing that mycotoxin in their building. And I'm like, well, it's not in your building. If it's in your building, it's in your pantry. Uh, you, know? Mm, and, and it, you know? That's huge. You know? So we need to start with the pantry if you're doing human testing and finding high levels especially yeah. things like um, okra toxin is a really good example of That's one right. of them that seems to show up pretty common in our, in our patient profiles. You need to start more with the pantry than the, than the building. Yeah. And the and vomitoxin don you know the, that that's also that I mean that's commonly uh, gr gr that that's commonly found uh, coming from fusarium which I and I've I've done uh, I've been doing this twenty one years I've done thousands and thousands of assessments and I've never once seen a fusarium in, in, infestation at a home uh, but it loves corn um, loves corn so uh, and by the way corn is a non food anyway in my opinion uh, Thank so you. <laughs> yeah. okay. and I live down here in Mexico where like corn is king right but it is such a it's such it's it carries so much this little poor corn it's not the corn of our ancestors today no. you know I'm sure those little tiny purple you know a little tiny red corn on the cobs from you know millennia ago were great but today unfortunately they're giant bombs of poison glyphosate totally. riddled there is actually contain people don't realize this but gluten or uh, corn actually contains gluten you know it's it's quote unquote safe levels of it unless you're somebody like me who's a canary in the coal mine then it backfires there too the it is such the carrier of these mold you know spores bocs mycotoxins it likes them all it seems to just sponge it all up there and then it's it in everything in everything from body care products to fillers and medications to you know, non-caking items, you know, when you see things that say dextrin or maltodextrin, it's always corn unless otherwise specified. And so, yeah, Jason, you're like, a lot of people are probably sitting here right now, like I'm re ready to jump off a building, at least it's yeah, maybe no. a non-moldy building. So <laughs> well, hopefully they buckled their seatbelts and they won't be able to jump off uh, without. There you, know, you go. There you lot. go. Um, yeah. So where you've given us resources around what's on your website of this little, like walk, walk through our house guide and uh, where to start with this, what, like, what simple places do you advise 
people to start in this journey because you've just blown. I mean, we've gone through so many rabbit holes today around biophilic design to proper testing to you know misinformation to fear and its impact on all of this. We have already alluded to a little bit of the impact on our health of these types of toxins in our environment. I mean, I can tell you as a clinician, they definitely sit on your immune system and prevent it from doing its job. They definitely impact mitochondrial function. They definitely impact, as he mentioned, the dopamine, which is going to impact all of your hormones relationships, like all of your hormonal orchestra, um, definitely going to impact your neurochemistry, definitely going to impact the way you even absorb certain nutrients. Um, and so leading to further malabsorption, it's just massive of the, the, the reach it has into our health. And so what are some tangible first steps? Let's, let's take this from the, oh my God, this is too much. This is overwhelming to what are the tangible next steps to take that bring us back into the light of hope? Well, uh, you know, the first thing is you need to uh, focus on moisture, uh, and and so really you need to make sure you maintain your building. Uh, and so if you are renting, of course that's a challenge. But if you if you if you own your home, uh, make sure that you maintain the outside of the building so the water doesn't get in the first place. And then uh, in the inside, uh, you want to manage your humidity uh, and keep it in the sort of Goldilocks zone, which is between forty and sixty percent. Um, and uh, with a target of 45%. So that means you're going to want to get humidity gauges and, and watch them uh, closely. Um, yeah. This is this is incredibly important. So you want to run air conditioning when necessary or run a dehumidifier as necessary. Uh, use your exhaust vents in your kitchen and your bathroom. And so, you know, prevention is key on all this stuff. Um, and you're going to want to also, you know, if you do have a problem, there's only three things you can really do with a mold problem. You can either, uh, you can do source control, which is remediate it. And that's mm -hmm. a whole different conversation. We do address that in the in the ebook and we talk about some things, some sort of do's and don'ts and what to avoid. Um, but source control is not always possible or practical. So oftentimes uh, the, the second thing you can do, which is useful to a lot of people is getting really good air purifiers. Um, and uh, and so that's extremely helpful to reduce exposure. It doesn't solve a mold problem. Um, and it doesn't, it's not, it's not a substitute for remediation, but it, but it's certainly helpful. And uh, so you're going to want to get an air purifier that has a lot of carbon in it because that takes out the VOCs. Just plain HEPA filters only take out particles. Um, okay. And so you're going to want to have a, an air purifier um, like Austin Air or IQ Air uh, are two really good uh, units that, that have a lot of carbon. Um, but there are other filters out there that have a decent amount, Air Doctor, um, Metafy, Jasper even. Um, and then the, the third thing you can do if you've got a, a known issue um, is, and this is whether it be VOCs or mold, is ventilation. And so uh, that means you can open the windows when the weather's nice, uh, when it's not too hot, too cold, or too humid. Um, but also there are mechanical ventilation systems or air exchange systems called ERVs or HRVs. Uh, and these are extremely effective for diluting uh, poor indoor air, right? We live in these hermetically sealed boxes and building code doesn't require us to have air exchange. So these kinds of things can be really, really useful uh, for people who have the ability to, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to make those kinds of mechanical interventions. Um, but, but like I said before, you know, you can use your HEPA filters and you can use your HEPA vacuums and you can monitor the moisture and you can, and you should do all those things. Don't stop produce, stop bringing in chemicals into your home, get rid of the ones that you do have. Uh, you know, uh, if you're going to renovate, make sure that you look at resources mm -hmm. like greenguard.org to reduce chemical loads because those the products that you bring in are going to off gas over the course of years. So mm -hmm. there's lots of things when it comes to renovations and, and new construction that you're going to want to you know keep that stuff out. The, the uh, choices are abundant and available these days. You do not have to buy toxic chemicals in building materials. Um, and uh, but at the same time, like, the most important thing is that whenever possible, open your windows. I mean, it's such, it's like a, such a simple thing, but it, it is it is so, so, so critical. Um, and so uh, other than that, you know, the most important thing you can do is try to accept the fact that the mold is a function of nature and and to embrace the fact that um, that it is it is not the enemy, um, that that uh, that fear is the enemy when it comes to this stuff. And that um, when, when it comes down to what to do about it, it really is about speed. Uh, so if you see something, smell something or feel something, do something. I love that. I love that. Such a powerful mantra. Jason, where can people find you? Because yes, we well, so, about this amazing booklet that you give, but you do so much and share so much with the world. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And um, the the best place for people to go initially is to gotmold.com slash metabolic matters. Uh, and so that's all one word. 
uh, Metabolic Matters, gotmold.com slash Metabolic Matters. And there you'll find uh, a link to the ebook that I mentioned. Uh, uh, you'll also find a discount code, which is MMP10, uh, nice. which will give your listeners a 10% discount for off of our test kits. Um, our Gottmold test kit allows you to test one, two or three rooms uh, with the same devices the professionals use, but without the cost or hassle associated with trying to find a higher one. Uh, and then once you uh, have one of our kits, you get to keep the air sampling pump, our, our cute little people call it the egg. Uh, and so you get to keep this and then you can buy refills and you can retest for $50 less. So kits start at 199, they go to uh, up to 299 for a three room kit and then refills start at 149 and go to 249. So um, people uh, often share them with friends as well so that they can also enjoy the savings. And so uh, this is a nice little utility for people. Um, and then also if people wanna get in touch and they wanna ask questions, um, one way is to, uh, Go to our website, the bottom of the homepage. Uh, there's a, a little contact field. I see every single one of the questions that comes through there. Uh, and then you can also post questions uh, on Instagram. I have an ask me anything pinned at the top. Nice. Uh, so I love to be able to interact with people there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we, we, uh, we, we often think, that we often say that we're more of an education company that happens to sell a test kit than a, a, a test kit company that uses content marketing. So. Uh, wow. If you have any questions, let us know. We're here to help. My gosh, this has been mind blowing. And I've even heard a few of these things before, but the levity of it, it's just like you hear it. You'll need to hear this again and again for it to sit in. And wow, we're going to have to have you back because there's so many other things that I would love to cover with you again. But Jason, what a gift you are to the world. Thank you for your four-year-old self who... Um, had this aware, like had this experience that brought you to where you are today. Thank you for the many people, including your mother, that is no longer with us, who reflects back maybe some other vulnerabilities in our environment that can lead to, uh, you know, to all kinds of health conditions from mental to cancerous and everything in between. Um, thank you so much for being on this passion and purpose and articulating it so so beautifully of what you do. You really have a gift of the gab and it's just an absolute honor and joy to have you, Jason. And thank you for all of your amazing resources for our community. Well, thank you. It has all been a blessing and it is a blessing to be here with you. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Metabolic Matters. We hope you found today's conversation insightful and empowering. As we wrap up today's episode, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible team and supporters who make this podcast possible. First, we'd like to thank our production team, Alex Sanchez, Cindy Kennedy, Jessica Gilman, and Lynn Hughes for their hard work behind the scenes. Our theme song was written by Julie Newmark and performed by Whiskey Flower. And finally, we want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and being a part of the Metabolic Matters community. Do you want to learn more? Please visit our website, metabolicmatters.org, and you can follow us on Instagram. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review and share it with your friends and family. And if you want to help support our mission, spreading awareness and knowledge about metabolic health, reach out. We'd love you to join with us. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on upcoming episodes. We have so much exciting content coming your way. Until next time, stay curious, stay empowered, and remember, your metabolic health matters.